Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> What's in a name? Juliet cries out, bemoaning the misfortune of being infatuated with a young man with the wrong one. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Now, I hate to give spoilers for those who haven't seen or read Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> but things don't go so well for the young pair. Now, we would never, or we'd hope we would never, meet the fate of the star-crossed lovers in Shakespeare's tragedy. Our names, like those of the Montagues and the Capulets, also hold power and meaning. The power of connection. The power of alienation. Our names can form our identity. They can alter the impressions and associations one has of us. They can be a source of pride a source of ridicule, a source of pain. Take a moment now to just think about your own name, the way it has shaped your identity, the way your identity has imprinted upon it. Do you feel at home in your name? Does it feel alien to you? Perhaps you carry the name you were given birth. Perhaps you've changed your name to better suit the you you've discovered yourself to be. Now, over the years, I've had many names. The name I was born with, Krista Westervelt. The names I married into, three times over, each serving as a temporary home. When I was 21, I got married for the first time and took on my then husband's last name, Fernandez. It was a perfectly solid name until I started job hunting with it. Krista Westervelt's resume got plenty of callbacks. Krista Fernandez's, not so much. After the calls kept not coming, even for less competitive openings, I decided to try a little experiment and use both Westervelt and Fernandez on my resume. Sadly, this helped. When the calls picked up, it was bittersweet. Job prospects, great. Proof of potential discrimination, bad. Still, I was thrilled when I got a call to come in to interview for a secretarial desktop publishing position at a top real estate firm in a pricey master planned community. Now this was back in Georgia, so don't worry yourself too much about trying to guess what community this was. Um, so on the day of the interview with the head broker, I did my best to show enthusiasm without appearing over eager, and it seemed to work. The head broker introduced me around, gushed over my portfolio, talked about the job as if it were mine already. I was measurably ecstatic. <laughs> And then she asked, so, Westervelt's your maiden name? Maybe she's just curious about my background, I thought, as I squeaked out a tepid, yes. Well, it's a good thing you added it to your resume or I wouldn't have called you, she said. We don't want Rosie Perez answering our phones. For those of you who aren't familiar with the actress Rosie Perez, many consider her distinctive accent to be one of her trademarks. And, evidently, not the trademark accent my interviewer considered appropriate for her clientele. Now, I'd love to say that the highlight reel of my early 20s shows me telling that broker exactly where to put her <laughs> in her idea of an appropriate phone voice. <laughs> Or, better still, that I had calmly asked her, Oh, why would you want Rosie Perez answering the phones? <laughs> Leaving her to stumble on her own prejudice. 
Instead, I just sat there, stunned and silent, for what felt like an eternity, but most likely wasn't. I doubt the broker even noticed my discomfort. She called a few days later to offer me the position, and I politely declined. Woo! <laughs> I politely declined, still not emboldened enough to speak out against her behavior, still clinging to my own fear of what good would it do anyway. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's webpage on national origin discrimination states, for now at least, national origin discrimination involves treating people applicants or employees unfavorably because they are from a particular country or part of the world, because of ethnicity or accent, or because they appear to be of a certain ethnic background, even if they are not. It goes on to say, an employer may not base an employment decision on an employee's foreign accent unless the accent seriously interferes with the employee's job performance. Now, that's all well and good, but the real estate broker hadn't discriminated against me for my accent or my perceived national origin, only against the hypothetical me who hadn't added Westerbilt to her resume. She only passed on the Fernandez only me. She offered the Westerbilt me a job how do you file suit on behalf of the hypothetical? How do you file suit on behalf of the people whose otherwise qualified resumes got tossed in the bin, disqualified only by their names? A 2017 Forbes piece titled, Minorities Who Whiten Resumes Get More Job Interviews notes that companies are more than twice as likely to call minorities if they submit whitened resumes, so altering the name to say, make it sound whiter, editing organizational affiliations to hide their racial ties, those sorts of things, than candidates who reveal their race, and such discrimination is just as strong for businesses that claim to value diversity as those who don't. Consider the consequences to one's psyche from having to consistently erase oneself in order to make yourself palatable to those who hold the reins to your livelihood. Consider how much more disheartening it is to perform the erasure of one's identity in order to slide under the radar of those who claim to value diversity. Consider how much harder it is to reconcile and overcome the unconscious bias of the well-meaning than the overt bias of folks like that your real estate broker. Nearly a decade on from my encounter with that broker, I'd remarried and taken on the last name Reed. So no more whitening was required on my part. <clears throat> or so I thought. When I was pregnant with the youngest of my three children, my growing family relocated to Athens, Georgia at the beginning of the fall term at UGA, and we needed to rent a home. Like many college towns at the beginning of a school year, Athens didn't have much left in the way of available rentals at the time, so the prospects were pretty slim. In spite of this, we managed to find a privately owned home that fit our budget just outside of town, and so we jumped on it. The owner showed the four and a half of us around the property, <laughs> remarking on how delightful our kids were and how nice it was going to be to have a young family renting their home. The house was ours for the taking. We'd just need to fill out an application as a formality, and if all looked good, we'd hear back in a day or two. 
Two days passed. No call. A few more days passed. <coughs> Nothing. And so my husband called to check in. Turns out the owners got to the part in the application where the names of the occupants were listed. Michael Reed, Krista Reed, two Fernandez children, <coughs> and one Reed to be, and decided we weren't for them. Not because of the children, but because of me. Now, I'll not repeat their explanation verbatim, as it's wholly inappropriate for this venue. But suffice it to say, they weren't about to rent to a white woman who would betray her people by procreating with an individual they considered unfit based on my children's last name. Now, I'm pretty sure upon hearing this, my husband did not hold his tongue with the owner the way I had 10 years prior with the broker, as he was not one to hold back or mince words. Unfortunately, his non mince words did little to change the situation. And just as little, actually, as my stern silence with the real estate broker in the interview nearly a decade prior. We could have filed a report of discrimination with the Georgia Fair Housing Division. After all, the Fair Housing Act states that it shall be unlawful to refuse to sell or rent after the making of a bona fide offer, or to refuse to negotiate for the sale or rental of, or otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling to any person because of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, or national origin. But how do you prove something that happened in a phone conversation that wasn't recorded? And even if we could prove discrimination, then what? We didn't want to rent from bigots anyway, especially if they were only renting to us because they were forced to. It wasn't like a discrimination suit was going to be their Saul on the Damascus Road moment. And so we did nothing. And changed nothing. And here we are. There is nothing about the road our society has traveled over the last two decades that makes me believe that the real estate broker would feel any less confident in discriminating against hypothetical me for my hypothetical accent. In fact, she might feel especially emboldened now. There's nothing about the road our society has traveled over the last decade that makes me confident that the potential landlords would feel any less entitled to discriminate against me and my family. In fact, they might even be more open about it. My not speaking up certainly hasn't helped much, but I am certainly not alone in not speaking up, right? FBU's Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Office notes that there are multiple reasons people don't speak up to report discriminatory behavior. Fear that nothing will be done. Fear that they, or the complaint, won't be taken seriously. Fear of reprisals. Fear of being labeled a troublemaker. Feeling alone or isolated that no one else objects to the behavior, feeling embarrassed or humiliated. And these are common and understandable fears, right? But now faced with another 10 or 20 or who knows how many years of a society that ignores the laws we put in place to protect the marginalized, that continues to isolate in other people with impunity, I feel it's time for me to break out of my complacency. So what has been holding me back? Is it my own struggle against feeling like an imposter fighting a battle I feel I can't really claim to be mine? Benevolent assumptions remind me that while my eldest children's last name sounds Hispanic, 
It actually comes from their father's Hawaiian and Filipino heritage. When I've been handed Spanish language forms to fill out for my daughter, even though I only speak and read the rusty Spanish from three years of study in high school, and my daughter's limited Spanish at that time came from Dora the Explorer and Sesame Street. <laughs> When my now teenage daughter is automatically assigned the Spanish-speaking road instructor for driver's ed, and he asks me over the phone if she speaks Spanish, and I tell him no, and he reassures me that it's okay, because a lot of kids push back against their parents and their language. <laughs> he says he knows this because he pushed back against his parents, so I shouldn't worry. And I don't know how to correct him at this point, and I don't know if I even should. These are gestures of kindness and connection based on mistaken identity, a kindness that feels misplaced and somewhat undeserved. It's hard to know how to mention the discrimination I and my children have experienced without feeling like it needs some kind of footnote without feeling a bit like I'm applying for a disabled parking permit on account of having stubbed my toe. <laughs> so I remain silent, complacent. And in a sense, through my silence, complicit. And if I, out of a sense of fear and uncertainty, don't speak from my place of privilege, and I don't speak for my place of collateral damage, think of how many don't speak out for whom such discrimination is a constant fact of life. The poet Sappho wrote, what cannot be said will be wept. In their article, discrimination, what it is and how to cope. The American Psychological Association notes a link between discrimination, stress, and health problems, noting that people who say they face discrimination rate their stress levels higher on average than those who say they've not experienced discrimination, with these rates holding true across racial and ethnic groups. The negative health impacts of chronic stress due to discrimination or being a member of a commonly discriminated against group include anxiety, depression, obesity, high blood pressure, and substance abuse. The potential for negative health impacts did not de decrease for exposure to less overt instances of discrimination. An undercurrent of not belonging leads to a heightened watchfulness that the APA article notes as a recipe for chronic stress. As my two oldest find their way into and through adulthood and the attendant responsibilities that come with it, I find undercurrents of watchfulness seeping into my hopes and fears for their futures. Recently, while we were at a local festival, my daughter approached the owner of a business to inquire about a summer job. When I heard the owner ask for her name, I held my breath. She gave her first name. He asked for her last name. I turned away, too tense to see or hear his response. She got hired. But there's some part of me that wonders if the owner had not seen her and spoken to her in person. If she had applied online, would he still have hired her? To wonder feels cynical. But in a society where it has become a national pastime to scapegoat and dehumanize those whose names or bodies are or are read as Latino, it can be a struggle to give the benefit of the doubt. And it can feel naive to do so. Still, ours is not a call to cynicism. 
Ours is not a call to distrust. As you use our living tradition challenges us to confront powers and structures of oppression with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. It is said that if you want to care for and nurture something, you call it a flower. If you want to kill it, you call it a weed. While loud and insistent voices may be doing all they can to label our brothers and sisters weeds, to demand retribution for their crimes of being what they've been all their lives, we can counter that discourse, reject those labels. We can use our individual and collective voices to raise our objections, to let the marginalized know they are not alone, to give them space to bloom and to thrive. As W.H. Auden wrote in his poem, September 1st, 1939, defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies. Yet dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them, of arrows and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming Plain. My friend, let us be messengers of justice in a time of oppression, and an affirming flame in a time of dark. Amen and blessed be. Amen.